What do you do if you're a parent of an adult child who is mentally challenged and then goes and performs a horrible, horrible act? We're going to find out tonight with Walt Stawicki, Raider on Public Exposure. Walt, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Uh, first off, as one father to another, I uh, feel sorry for your loss and for the loss of everyone in this particular circumstance. Your son was Ian Stawicki. Yes. So we got to go back to the day of the event as the, the Cafe Racer event took place. Um, how did you find out? My wife called me. I was on the freeway coming down to her house. I was around Northgate. I was going to get off at 50th at the university and she called me and she was watching TV. She had just seen a mugshot photo from, well, the cameras inside the racer. She had seen our son standing there. And then there know. was no question in her mind. Her brother's son came over about 15 minutes after I arrived. He had seen it too. That's Ian. There was no question. There was no question. Can, can you describe the feeling at that moment that, that you realized that your son had been the one who had killed There wasn't any feeling. There wasn't any feeling. It was just utter surprise and numbness at that point. Protective numbness. I've almost vomited on the freeway thinking about that day since, but I didn't have that sort of feeling at the time. It was just detachment from the reality of it. Tell me about Ian. What was he like as a young child? He was sweet. He had difficulties in school, but he would go for walks and ask the birdies to come over to his fingers. He liked nature. Uh, I didn't show you the last picture, but it was uh, in front of one of the largest trees in Seattle, perhaps the oldest tree in Seattle. And as, as his mother said, if he had a religion, it was nature. We've gotten letters that say exactly what I thought about him. He was an old-fashioned gentleman. He protected women and children. He did what he thought was right. He did not get into people's faces and argue with them. That started changing. When did that happen? I would say that these sort of things in the last maybe three years, and we'd seen other things before. As I said, he had difficulty in school. Early in grade school, it was called dyslexia. He could not perform things from one modality to another and relate them. He couldn't listen and write. He couldn't read and speak about it. Those things did not communicate in his mind. It was very difficult. But he, but he joined the military, though. He took a GED and, out of sheer determination, did quite well on that. Went into the military, did not make it through. Uh, he made it through his basic training. He got an assignment at Fort Drum, New York, and uh, things started coming apart there. It wasn't what he thought the military was going to be. He didn't have the social skills and understanding to accommodate himself to them. And frankly, I think the military was quite a mess during that time. He came back uh, using methamphetamine. He uh, came back after having a grenade go off in a trench not too far from his head. He came back with an SS tattoo that he did not ask to have put on him. He called me once crying, just utterly crying. Why did he make me do it? I didn't want to. The guy was sent to the hospital because he was holding a knife up to Ian's neck. They were apparently uh, doing some sort of bonding and uh, it just didn't come across that way to my son who thought if you're holding a knife on somebody's neck you're threatening them. And so that was when he was 18, 19 mm -hmm, years old. Mm -hmm. this so was that was around before 88, 89. Yeah, 20 years yeah, ago. Yeah, a ways back. So he returned, and you, regardless of, of whether it was there or wherever it happened, you knew that as, as he got older that he had mental challenges. He could not keep a job. He could uh, not stay in one place and pursue one thing. He lost interest in things when they weren't perfect. We saw this as part of the dyslexic and somewhat of those sort of simpler diseases, perhaps. 
Um, he, we thought maybe he was drinking, and then it was, well, he's not drinking, but why does he have these geographics? He'll go someplace, be gone, not talk to us, come back, never say anything about it, leave everything behind him. Spent about $30,000 once on a vehicle. Where did he get his money? He got it from a third or fourth generation trust in the family, off of his mother's side of the family. So he, he couldn't hold a job. Was, did he apply for public assistance of any kind? Never. Never. All right. And he had no GI benefits. He was cut loose from mm -hmm. them. Was, was he an angry young man? As I say, lately, yes, he was angry. Over no, the it, past three years. Let's talk about yeah, the past let's three Let's talk about frustration as opposed to rage and hate you and going to kill you type anger. It was frustrated rage about how things ran, how the world was, how the world was coming to an end, the oceans, the air, the croplands. It was all destroyed. We've made a mess out of it. He loved children. He loved children. He was a protector. He loved to be around the children, but, uh, you know, the cousins and help them and do things and take them around. But uh, he certainly did not want to bring any into the world. Well, at the same point in time, I mean, we all know what happened. Yes. Uh, and he brought the end of the world not only to himself, but to several families. Yes. Did you see his over the past several years did you see his anger increasing or his frustration increasing no mostly we saw his isolation and refusal to engage with family i don't want to talk i'm doing something else i'm reading this book i don't know about that ask somebody else i'm not involved now he had access to guns yes uh was that something that you wanted or did it matter You know, let me back up. Before I'm on time. record as being a gun salesman for over 10 years yeah. and uh, doing that uh, somewhat as his low-key business. We've gotten into it as hobby. He was brought up around guns. His brother was brought up around guns. His sister was brought up around guns. Uh, you know, it was one of the things that he liked about the military, I suppose, was uh, but know, guns the comfort and, with that. Guns and drugs and extreme frustration don't mix, do they? A lot of things don't mix, yeah, and that's a combination that uh, didn't mix too well. Obviously didn't mix too well one morning. Were you ever afraid of him in the no. last three years? People have asked me that. I was never afraid of him. I was afraid, as was his mother, for him. What do you mean by that? We didn't see him as aggressive. We saw him as angry. We thought he would challenge somebody intellectually and get beaten up for telling them they were stupid and didn't know what they were talking about. We thought that on another occasion he might be just too friendly to somebody and get along with them and uh, that we'd get a knock on the door and he would be dead someplace because of it, uh, be robbed. He didn't use banks. He carried uh, himself around. You know, in the, so he in lived pocket. with you. He was no, he did not live with me. He barely talked to me. I used to be the good parent until one day I wasn't. And then it was mother. Mother has hepatitis C. She's not doing it all well. She basically needs caretaking. Well, who was we he were working some of that. Who was he emotionally dependent upon? Dependent upon? I don't know that he was emotionally dependent on anybody. That's part of isolation. You don't have somebody to share those things with. Some degree with his mother. Some degree with his girlfriend and uh, some degree with some friends who have uh, moved out of the area. He would visit, he would call, but not, uh, you know, not somebody who could say, I need to talk to somebody, go out tonight. Not that sort of a life. Do you have any idea at all what was it that led him to do the acts that he did on that particular day? No, I have no idea what did that. I have no idea what the relation was with those people. There were, apparently was some little bit of relationship or the attempt to make a relationship. I think it went wrong. I think he misunderstood those people and their intentions, but I think there was some animus that had been created. Mm -hmm. During the time of you know, him being an adult child, 
I mean, it, it, You're talking over two decades. Yeah, yeah. Was my was the introduction accurate? Was he mentally challenged? Mentally disturbed is probably I, I don't want to use a, a term that I don't know what I'm talking about. Well, I think he was manic depressive, and he had some things that look schizophrenic. Uh, Ideation, which is what the military talked about, that he just put two and two together differently than the Army thought two and two added up. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what they meant by that particularly, but... Uh, Did you seek help for him? We tried to get him to help. We tried to get people to talk to him. I found a fellow that he would not go to, uh, just a counselor. We thought he was autistic a few years ago. And I tried to get him uh, to somebody that had been a fisherman and in the military. You know, and, could never get him to take the step. Mom tried to get him to a dentist. You could not get him to make a second appointment to see a dentist. He would comply and then run. Everything just was do it, and then if it didn't work, boom, off to the side. So you got to that point where, you know, it's like, I wish something would happen here. I wish that there would be something where, you know, he would not have a choice of backing out and doing things. But I told somebody today, it's like a 200 pound fish on eight ounce line. You want to keep a relation. You don't want to have a complete severance. And you get in- Because he was your son. He's our son. You know, we did not want him someplace where he's gonna end up dying on the street when I'm gone, says mom. You know, nobody will take him. He's not got any resources. He doesn't have any sort of steady companionship on the outside. We hey, know that with a girlfriend, it was on and off. And but you say that nobody will take him, but it sounds like he wasn't willing to willing go with him. Willing to anyone. take, yes. So one of the reasons that you're here and one of the reasons that you're, in fact, I think, what you've said is that why you're out talking is that you, you want people to know about uh, that there might be ways to help um, adult children who have mental difficulties. One of the first things I learned that there is a support network for parents of those children, senior parents of adult children. Uh, there are meetings here and uh, there are meetings at Harborview on a weekly basis. There is a weekly meeting at a uh, church on the North End that can be accessed through uh, the Greenwood Community Center. There are some things that I had never heard of before that I came by in these meetings. These meetings I came by because I talked to my friends about my issues and they say, I know about this. They're not something I found on the side of a bus or saw a public service on TV. Mm -hmm. uh, they're not being pushed in front of us. Ken Schramm said, oh, the law has changed. You don't have to have eminent danger anymore. Everybody else has told me that, well, we have that law, but it's not implemented because of money. And I'm thinking, it's not a money issue, you know. He doesn't have insurance, but uh, he does have some money. If he were willing to put it to it, just like his teeth, he could have had his mm -hmm. teeth fixed. But you were quoted in the in the newspaper, and I think several news blogs is saying that you wish you had lied. Yes. Uh, so that yes. you could have gotten him help. Call the cops and say he was going to kill me, and that still works. They have to take somebody in a DV situation like this and where somebody's at that pitch and they have to hold them and take a look at them. The difference between symptoms like he shows and a 24-7 schizophrenic is that if he were talking and his mother was disturbed by his talk, please don't talk about people that way. Rude talk that you might say coming from a KKK type person. Uh, he had some very extreme views about the war in Iraq and uh, the people that were fighting there. Dehumanizing speech came out of him. I didn't think he was going to go down the street and kill somebody who looked Middle Eastern. Uh, the person on the ground would talk to Spanish people and then he would bitch about immigration. He would talk to people in the stores, irregardless of who they were. Somebody once asked him if he was Afghanistan. He did not take it as an insult. He laughed about it. You know, this is kind of funny, isn't it? His mother would say, please, I don't like that kind of talk, and he would stop. He had a piece of control in, in those situations. Somehow that control didn't click this morning that he went into the cafe. You, but what I'm trying to say with that is 
24 hours, you know, for somebody who can pull it together, and I've talked to other people, and their schizophrenic children have been in 24 hours, 72 hours, longer, and they learn how to work that system. They learn that they just need to do a little eye contact, be present, know what day it is, and uh, oriented to the situation, give an answer that's a direct response to the question, and they'll probably not be held. Got to take a very short break. We're talking with Walt Stawicki, who is Ian Stawicki's father. Ian Stawicki is the cafe racer killer. Um, Mr. Stawicki is talking with us about the potential for uh, parents of adult children with mental difficulties learning and having some alternatives as to how they can deal with their children. Um, and, you know, it doesn't matter how old they are, they're always your children, right? Forever. Um, you've gone back to the Cafe Racer yourself. I walked by it two times, and the third time I walked by it very slowly. There were people there on that occasion, and uh, they were tending the garden there, and uh, the woman tending the garden asked me if I knew any of those people. I told her that it was, it was my son that was the shooter. And she stopped for a second. We bonded and we talked for a few minutes. And uh, I talked with her, you know, about how it didn't feel like anything other than words to express sympathy to say I had done all I do had done and to hear other people say all I could do was an easy lie because afterwards you see it so much differently. You see a different time span and you see the urgency that could have been there. It's a deck of cards and it's all wild cards. I want to emphasize that. It goes along in a few years and it may be getting worse and boom, it's gotten as bad as it can get. What have you learned in terms of what kind of help might be out there today? Support for the parents, that's necessary so that you don't get locked in. But it wasn't the parents who did the shooting. It was not the parents who did the shooting, but if the parents have more strategies, if the parent, and I'm not talking, you know, it's like how to take care of a difficult child and ways to get them to clean their room. If the child is seriously needing help, and isn't going themselves. The parents need strategies and somebody to help them work getting that child to the point of taking help, of accepting help. Somebody to hold their hands during the frustration, somebody to say simply lie, somebody like at the Harborview group who says, you know, I understand how to fill out the forms, whose desk to put them on to help you get these things through, through the system. And again, she's working pretty much with the, the welfare system, the indigent system and such. There's a very small system of people out there in private practice, but, uh, but if you can't they get can't put them in courts, they can't get them, you know. That to me is the point where it, it just feels like, in my experiences beforehand, with the Kendra Laws of New York, they're going through a new addendum to that where parents and family will be credited with good information that the person is really ill, the person really is a danger, there should be an evaluation, the person should be held against their will because they realize that is a credible witness to the person's life, not possibly somebody who has an ax to grudge against them. Well, besides you see what I'm saying there? The state has said that, well, you're just saying this about somebody in the family to get rid of them, to revenge on them, to do some petty thing to that person. Let me ask you this. Besides waking up from this nightmare and, and none of it being true, well, it's all true. What would you want to have happen now? What would I want to happen now? With my son and five other people dead, hundreds of people directly related to them, all victims. Mm -hmm. 
the people I've talked to and the problems they've had getting their children. I haven't talked to anybody, and I've talked to people on the dog walk. Excuse me, is that something in your family? Or No, that's the cafe killer, my son. <gasps> and then we relate stories. Nobody's been that far from somebody that needs help. Nobody has been that far from it. And yet we see all the other things on the buses. We see all the other things on the TV. We see numbers for all sorts of other help. Are we blind to it, or is it not there? Is it not being spoke about? Several times in different threads on blogs, don't talk about mental illness, don't use that word, don't talk about demons. It's such a strong word. Yeah, if he, if it's a had, demon to me. If he had diabetes, he we would have had, had help. And that would have been Nobody would have been ashamed to talk about diabetes. Nobody would have thought that it was maybe catching and they should distance themselves from it. The military certainly wanted to distance themselves from it. He visited friends in Los Angeles and came by on one of his psychotic thought episodes. He was going there to re-enlist to go in uh, the secret uh, ops world. He was uh, on the day that he did the racers. Is there he was trying to get down to Fort Lewis to check in with his superiors. And, and all He's been held down there and thrown out the door as fast as they could rather than, oh, this guy needs He's help. He's been held down at Fort He's Lewis? He's been held at Fort Lewis. I doubt if it's on record. He was able to purchase a gun. Yes. More than once. How? You take a carry permit from this state, which is a shall issue state. I, I don't know what that means. Shall issue means you will do this unless you have a good reason. Two reasons, domestic violence, felonies, been court ordered into a mental facility, ordered into, not just held and looked at ordered for treatment, found mentally incompetent to some degree, or done something felonious. That's the exceptions in this state. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, they must give you the permit, permit in hand. I walk into a store, he walks into a store, one of the schizophrenics from our shelter walks into a store, buys a gun, walks out with it. Three-day waiting period, that's for other people not for people with a permit. There is that difference. Oh, once you get the permit. It's cash and carry. Wow. There is no psychological evaluation to get that permit. California has it. How can society be protected from someone with a mental illness like your son? Good start is to say that before you are allowed to purchase, as in Costa Rica, not to carry, but to purchase, you bring a letter from a doctor. I would like to see it differently. I would like to see, like this Kendra's Law, you want to carry guns? Well, let's hear from your family. Let's hear from a doctor. I don't see that as bothering anybody's well-regulated militia. I was in the business. I even spent one year sending a little money to the NRA. I gave them up over Virginia Tech. That man had the right to have the gun because he had not been uh, judged incompetent in law. Incompetence is too high a barrier. A danger to himself or others or maybe too loose a cannon is high enough a barrier. My son would have not passed that barrier. So he would have been, well, I, I, whose responsibility is this? We here in the United States, and probably everywhere, but in the United States want to put a blame on somebody. Whose responsibility is this? Well, are we talking responsibility or are we talking blame? Because responsibility is the ability to respond to the situation. And in that case, his mother and I, his brother, his girlfriend, those who knew him did not respond well enough. We did not beat the system until we found the weakness in it that worked. But then it Guilty, was, blame, he pulled the trigger. Yeah, but then it was it, society, it was these families, it was your family. It was all of these who are forever... Victimized. Victimized. Uh-huh. Uh, and the next time that someone is in this circumstance, what is it that a parent can do? What is it that a loved one can do? What is it that any friend can do? to stop this from ever happening? 
I don't know if you can stop it, but you can try. You can find the resources and never stop trying. What resource would you like to have had as his father? I would have liked a lower barrier for him to be held and evaluated and not just for a short piece of time. I would have liked him to have been checking in with somebody in the profession on a regular basis for several months. Do you want legislation to, to now take place as a result of this? Uh, what do you want? That would be a good point to start with, yes. Yes. What should the legislation say? Lower barriers. If somebody says there's something wrong here, go with that. Do not be a shall permit state. Have a, let's look at this closely. Copy what California does. Just a little bit of evaluation rather than rap sheet. We only look for a rap sheet in this state. Oh, you have to be a criminal to... You have to be a criminal or already judged crazy by a court and sent in to a mental evaluation. What Found kind of things did, did, had you tried that? Had you, had you tried to send him to get him sent in? Or? I never thought of lying. Dumb as it sounds today, mm -hmm. never lied. Maybe that's another problem with being a parent. Well, as we get... You and know, maybe you just kind of fear, you know, uh, if it doesn't happen, will I ever see that son again? Will he ever come around me? Will he ever trust me? Will he die off in another state someplace? That's a scary future. It is a scary It's a future. narrow little thing to climb along, yeah. Uh, you get, you lose the response, ability to respond to it. You know, somebody said it's a PTSD, it's not. It, you never post. You're never out of it. As long as you're carrying the concern for a child like this, you're never past the trauma. We're about at the end of our time. Walt, thank you very much for being with us. That's been Public Exposure, Walt Stawicki. See you right here next time on Public Exposure.